Welcome to Strength in Leos. What's up, everybody? It's Evan back with Strength in Leos. I hope everybody is having a great one today. I'm back to bring you guys another episode of the podcast. This episode is also featuring Shane Kelly. This is going to be part two to the episode that we did before. This is also included in one of the episodes that we recorded a while back. So I hope you guys enjoy this one also. This episode will also have a video component to it. So if you guys haven't checked out our YouTube channel, make sure to check it out. Go check out our channel at Strength in Leos. You'll see a ton of videos with the episode that we do with Chris. You'll see the videos to the Uncovering Sasobek series and then all the other videos that we're recording for this series. And as we also transition to having the audio format for those of you guys who like audio and then also video. So if you guys haven't checked out our YouTube channel, make sure to subscribe to that and check out all the videos that go along with these podcasts. Anyway, that's it. Thank you guys for the continued support. The support coming from Shane's side of the hobby and then others who really like listening to these crossover episodes where I cross over into different sectors of the reptile industry and seeing what all that stuff is all about. And speaking of support, I'd like to give a huge Patreon shout out to Josiah. Thanks for supporting the podcast. Speaking of Patreon, for those of you guys who aren't on Patreon, I'm actually thinking of making Patreon free for the month of September and October. So make sure to stay tuned on that. More info to come on that just for People who aren't on Patreon uh, want to get a gist of what it's like, what we do there, um, and just seeing how things are over there with a lot of great support. So make sure to keep an eye out on that. More details coming soon for free Patreon for anybody who signs up uh, for the month of September and October. And before we go on, I want to say thank you to our sponsors. The Blessed Gecko over the last five years has acquired an incredible variety of geckos from some of the top genetics available. In the past, they have maintained all animals within their own collection as holdbacks as they have taken time to observe genetic pairings, dispositions, sizes, coloration, pattering, and etc. Go check them out on Facebook and Instagram, and of course go check out what they have available for sale. Impeccable Gecko is a small to mid-sized, family-operated, hobbyist breeder operation. They specialize in leopard geckos with high-quality genetics. An impeccable gecko, integrity, and animal welfare is above all else. Miles Schwartz works with some awesome morphs and lines that are not only high quality, but also fairly rare in the hobby. Go check out their social media and awesome YouTube channel. John Scarborough of Gecko Boar Reptiles has kept and bred more than 80 species of reptiles, and his focus has turned to specializing within the genus Eublepharis. He has worked hard to pioneer some of the most cutting-edge leopard geckos while maintaining genetic purity and honesty. Go check out their website for their most up-to-date availability, and don't forget to follow all of their social media. Suburban Geckos is operated by Chris Charlton. Chris's passion and enjoyment for herpticulture, and more specifically leopard geckos, drove the desire to take his hobby to the next level. The Bourbon Geckos treats every animal with the utmost care and respect and cut no corners when it comes to the health and integrity of their geckos. Suburban Geckos is a strong supporter of the Strength and Leos podcast, so follow them on social media and check out what they have available for sale. Grove Geckos is a family-owned and oriented medium-scale leopard gecko business. Lance Musgrove is a hobbyist breeder with the goal of producing healthy, visually stunning, and refined genetics for their geckos. They can be found online at grovegeckos.com or on social media like Facebook and Instagram. Give them a follow and reach out to Lance at any time. Spotty Tail Geckos is a small hobbyist breeder that focuses on quality genetics and maintaining excellent husbandry. Andy got started in the hobby when his daughter wanted a pet leopard gecko. He immediately fell in love with the animals and the hobby. Andy started breeding his first leopard geckos in 2015. To this day, he keeps a very small collection sourced from top tier breeders. Welcome back to the podcast, Shane. How's it going? Good, Evan. How you doing? Pretty good. So for anybody listening to this, this will be the second part to our impromptu two-part series. Uh, we recorded the first part a little bit after quarantine hit sometime in March. And like, just we had so many episodes recorded that that episode didn't go up. And now we're doing this two-parter uh, to catch up and see how everything's going with you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Man, a lot's happened since we recorded the first one, honestly. I mean, yeah. That, uh, at that time, it seemed like uh, shows were going to be shut down and be right back up soon. And here we are a year later, and things haven't changed too much. But still, a lot's happened personally. And I know a lot's happened with you personally, too. So, Exactly. A lot of It's crazy how much stuff could happen in a year. Um, so many things changing, moving locations, um, breeding seasons coming up. 
patching out so many crazy things. So definitely tons of stuff, uh, crazy things happening in the reptile world. Yeah, yeah. And uh, well, you know, speaking of reptile world and lots of stuff happening, man. I uh, all the U.S. Arc support lately and stuff, man. That's uh, really I'm really glad to see that in the community. Everyone finally like joining together and all for one cause, you know, helping each other out with that. And, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's really great to see that, especially like you're not even really like a leopard gecko guy. You ball pythons is your main thing. I know you have, um, you know, a pair of geckos, hog nose, um, stuff like that. But your main thing is ball pythons. So to see people from, you know, ball pythons and snakes and boas and chameleons and all these different sectors of the industry coming together for one cause, it's really cool to see that all on social media and seeing people's videos and stuff. Yeah, for sure. Like, you know, set some differences aside and uh, all put in together for towards the same goal. It's really nice. Exactly. Because when they come after our reptiles, like this is pretty much our whole hobby. Like I know you made tons of sacrifices for, you know, your reptiles and so many other people have. So it's their livelihood. So when they put that at risk, you know, we got to all join together and fight for a good cause. Yeah, absolutely. Now with you, you have so many things going on. Like I was just telling you, you grind harder than probably anybody in uh, the reptile industry. And in the last episode, we we're pretty much talking about how you go about uh, marketing yourself and doing all that stuff. So from now to then, like what has really changed in terms of like your marketing strategy or you still trying to connect with people? Like, do you feel like you're doing it at a higher level, the same level? So what's been going on with that? Um, well, I've definitely gained a lot of ground since uh, our first recording, and I'm still pretty much staying to the uh, same formula, though. I still just continue to network and, and branch out. And I, I, I mean, I have had more contact with some higher level people, but I, I really don't treat anyone different, honestly. I mean, uh, I still talk to the guys just starting out and the guys that have been around for 20 years. You know, I just I try to keep branching out and moving forward and bringing positivity into the hobby you know yeah and that's definitely awesome and really the secret i think to what you've done you treat everybody the same you're a super positive guy always sharing people's content which is super awesome um but yeah i remember in march you had like five thousand followers when we were first doing this and now you just hit 10k so a yeah. pretty, you basically doubled your following since a year pretty much which is pretty awesome to say the least yeah thank you thank you yeah, and I've actually had, man, I've had some consider considerable growth in my opinion on YouTube. I mean, back when we talked, I think I was somewhere around like 500 subscribers. And now I'm around 2,500. So that one jumped up pretty good. For yeah. me, it's harder to gain uh, traction in the YouTube world. It's a lot slower than my experience with Instagram. That, that's just my personal experience. So it could be different okay. for someone else. but All right. Yeah. Now for you, how do you think it's been? Cause you're really, a, you're a really good people guy and you're always um, talking with people and always trying to network with people. So how has that experience been um, now that there's no shows going on? Like I remember when we were at Anaheim, just, you know, hanging out and talking shop and whatever. Um, when the first time I met you in person and then now like that was my last show. So there hasn't really been any shows in California since then. So how has that been still connecting with people? when we're all online and through social media and stuff like that? Um, yeah, I, well, that's basically it right there is I took advantage of all the social media and you don't really have to go to a show to network, you know, through social media and everything. So right. I've taken advantage of that and I have traveled around and, and went and met people in person uh, at their facility or at other events. You know, there's, there's a, a reptile group up in Fresno, a little bit north of me, and they, they still have their little get togethers and stuff. So, uh, yeah, we still go meet up with people when I can. And yeah, I mean, where there's a will, there's a way, you know, <laughs> and exactly. And you've definitely found that way. And I think you really took advantage of this whole quarantine thing. Um, like your content has been amazing, especially on YouTube, like watching and you could see that through like anybody if you go and watch their first videos and then to like what they're doing now the your intros are awesome and stuff like that so you definitely see the growth um and i think quarantine definitely now that people are kind of at home a little bit more they're consuming a lot more content and you're like instead of saying like 
okay, now that I can relax now, but you're just kind of going harder and going the opposite way than a lot of people. Yeah, in fact, when quarantine hit, and that was like right when I I bumped up how much content I was going to put out too. I figured, you know, there's going to be more people sitting at home with, you know, All right. less activities to do. So might as well try to give them more stuff to watch and at least make their quarantine a little bit more enjoyable. That was my thought in the beginning. And I did, yeah, I just stayed with it since then. So. All right. And again, man, like you're just totally capitalizing. And like I'm saying, I'm slacking over here. The f- podcast just released today, actually, as we're recording this. Um, for the new season and you know you're taking advantage of the instagram the reels and all that stuff so you're definitely testing out new things and seeing what works for you yeah but i mean in your defense man you i mean you changed locations and stuff so i mean that's i i did yeah 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 yeah. that's (laughs) gonna slow you down a little bit and and you got some uh, responsibilities in your own life with what right. you're doing there. So yeah, I'm <laughs> totally understandable. I respect you for that, man, because you're still doing your thing, even though you got a lot going on in, in your other life. So. so speaking of big moves, I know you're going through a big move, changing to a totally different side of the country. And I know exactly how that is. So uh, for people who follow you and know you for being, you know, the Bakersfield guy, you know, in California doing the snake thing. Uh, let's talk about the move a little bit. Yeah, so we are actually going to be moving to Tennessee, Knoxville area, here within the next couple of weeks, actually, from when we're recording this. So it's uh, kind of stressful, I ain't going to lie, and you know, because you made a, a similar type move. So, right. yeah, I've had to do a lot of research and ask other guys that have done similar things and kind of get their guidance, you know, and uh, what to do and what not to do type things. but. Yeah, we're moving over there. Uh, just better opportunities and stuff over there for us personally. So, yeah, it's going to be sad exactly, leaving yeah. California, but <laughs> it is what it is, you know? Yeah. And f- so, Tennessee, how's the weather compared to where you're at right now? Well, we're gonna, I know it's in the ba- south, so. Yeah, compared to Bakersfield, it's going to be like super humid to us. So, I'm hoping yeah. we can adjust. But we've, we've been out there three times. Uh, through this process like securing employment and housing and all that and uh but i mean that's been through the winter month so okay. i mean it wasn't it wasn't bad for us at all i mean a little cold i mean there was some snow right. a little bit but nothing nothing like you know the north pole type stuff but yeah <laughs> that were that's where i'm at so yeah <laughs> negative 20 degrees out here and yeah miss that california weather <laughs> yeah <clears throat> you know so i i did hear that you know it can get hot and humid out there but i don't know we'll, we'll deal with it i mean originally we're from ventura county oh, like okay. down by the beach so right. moving to bakersfield was an adjustment for us and we made this one work so i mean we could we can make it work over there too yeah no beach in tennessee also so <laughs> now <laughs> all we got up here is lakes so we have lakes everywhere and then people have out here have never seen the ocean which is crazy for me so that's a huge adjustment on my end <laughs> yeah well right there in Ten- the knoxville area where we're going to be uh the tennessee river just kind of runs around and flows around and oh nice a, okay yeah it's different yeah. it's not it's not like something i've ever had out here so right it'll be cool and the the nature out there i could assume is like really beautiful from like stuff i've heard and like from your vlogs that's when you went out there to visit um it looks really nice oh yeah man the smoky mountains are right there there's trees everywhere which is definitely different than bakersfield you know so right <laughs> yeah yeah it'll yeah. be cool and I, i'm looking forward to it you know the kids will enjoy it and they'll have a little bit more outdoors activity and without it being you know 115 degrees in the summer and yeah yeah all right awesome and also we talked about your facility like getting out there you'll have basically a bigger facility because at the rate you're growing you're producing a lot of snakes, a lot of high quality snakes. So as you get bigger and you're kind of producing a bit more, you're going to need a bigger facility anyway. Yeah, it's, uh, it actually, that's one part that's definitely working to my advantage. And I learned uh, some things when I built this little place here of what I could do better and how I would do them different. And obviously I've branched out and talked to a lot of more a lot more people since then too so i'm kind of paying attention to their facilities how they're set up and how the mechanics of it work and yeah right. so 
If I stayed here, I would honestly probably outgrow this room within the next two years anyway, so I'd have to do something yeah. different at that point. Exactly, and it's been nice, again, going back to networking, it's nice to have those people to talk to and visit their facilities to see how the operation works from, like, how they have their thermostat set up and, you know, just the operational things and how they set up the room is really cool to see because you could take that and implement it into your facility um, and take like the best things that you see from each facility and kind of place it together to build kind of your dream facility almost. Yeah, for sure. I mean, just from the layout to like some people run ambient heat, they don't even use any kind of heating. Source, really? Heat that's source. interesting. Yeah. And then I, I like the belly heat program that yeah. I'm already set up on that. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of different ways to do it and it seems to, worked it for everyone in their own particular right. facility so it just goes to yeah. show you how how resilient reptiles are i mean i think sometimes we overthink things and i mean oh definitely you know, they, they've been around longer than we have so i mean they got exactly here somehow. yeah <laughs> yeah exactly and you're pretty much like we talked about breeding season and your breeding season now is pretty much all year round so you're going cycling getting clutches of eggs all year round which is amazing because i remember when you were first getting your first couple clutches and how going back to your youtube and having all of that on and now you're pretty much rooting all year round which is pretty crazy to see yeah and it, i that was something i didn't plan out it just just the way i set up my room unknowingly it just kind of worked to my advantage that way and, and i actually like it so i'm not like bombarded at one time a year with a whole bunch of hatchlings that just kind of tapered everything out hopefully all right Hopefully everything in Tennessee will work out that way too. I mean, I plan on setting up the at least the humidity and the temperature the same over there. So hopefully the the all the breeder females uh, react the same way. But I mean, they're animals. You never know how they're going to do. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So have you talked to like other breeders in the South? Like I know JK, JKR is in Georgia, so kind of in the South, and there's a lot of breeders in that Southern area. Have you talked to breeders on like their experiences on? their breeding season and how stuff works just in terms of their animals and like to see if there's any difference in terms of any of that stuff. Yeah. I've, I've talked to other people and, and there's actually a good group of people like all around me right there in Tennessee too. And then uh, there's the Georgia breeders right there too. So, I mean, they're, they're those states neighbor each other. So I have a good right. support network over there already. And yeah, I just kind of take what information I can out of them and kind of blend it into what I'm already doing and, you know, it, it, I, th I don't think we ever have it all worked out. I mean, we're always doing little tweaks and trying to make things more efficient as exactly. we go, right? Yeah. That's, that's pretty much all what Reptiles is. Like, every year you're going to do something different, make tweaks to make things better. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. But it's really just the evolution of making those small changes to see if we can get better production or, you know, all that good stuff. Yeah, for sure. So, uh how how has your leopard geckos reacted to the move so in general most of them are pretty good some haven't ovulated yet so i'm still waiting on a few ovulations but i heard some some tricks that a lot of breeders have told me about you know putting them next to other girls that are ovulating to see if that'll trigger it or like even get like a paper towel and leave it with a male and then like put that within the other tub and see if like once the female smells the male and stuff like that. So just small tips and tricks to get them to ovulate. But if not, then most likely they'll ovulate next year. And then I'll just be a behind on that project or whatever. But overall, it's been pretty good. But this snow has just been something else. So it's actually been pretty good for the other breeders because of that, you know, that pressure drop with the blizzards and stuff. But, um, you know, pretty much just adjusting as it goes and seeing how things work. Yeah, I think any any animal like humans included that are are used to like say california and then you go to a total different environment man it's gonna take you a year to probably adjust you know yeah exactly so did you grow up in california i i never asked you this but like did you just grow up in california your whole life yeah i was born and raised in santa paula right outside of oh, okay. Ventura, and yeah uh, i've been pretty much that's been my home base pretty much my whole life. I have lived in a couple other states just for real short periods. And, uh, right. but then I moved up into Bakersfield in 2011 and we've been here ever since. So now we've wow. been here 10 years and we're going on to Tennessee. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. It's totally new state. Like we said before. And also like you already 
um, started making your California crew, like once all the reptile and ball python breeders, you have some really great breeders out here in California with ball pythons. Um, but again, in Tennessee and like in the South, there's a ton of great breeders there too. So you already have your friends set up, so I'm sure you'll have <laughs> no problem adjusting. Yeah. And you know, with, with, uh, the social media and everything, I mean, it's real easy to stay in touch with everyone and send pictures and still interact with them on a, on a daily basis. And, and, and I'll make more connections and networking out there and it, it'll be good. And then eventually I'm assuming we're going to have shows and stuff again and, <laughs> and I'll run into the California guys again at the show. So. Exactly. Yeah. Cause I, the last time we, the first time we met and the last time we saw each other was that Anaheim show, which is crazy to even think like that was our last show us being together and we had no idea. So it's crazy to think back to like, what that actually was and now going to here where it's mask and no shows are going on. Yeah. I think I went to, I think Bakersfield had a little tiny local show right after the Anaheim show. I think that was my last show, but the Bakersfield one's real, real small, nothing like an Anaheim, you know, nothing yeah. like a super show, but yeah, little did I think that that would be like the last one for a while, you know? Yeah. So just adjusting and you know, you probably you've mastered social media now. So Hey, <laughs> You have all that covered and that's pretty much how it is now. Um, and I wanted to ask you, so for ball pythons, you guys kind of have your, like not, I wouldn't say things figured out, but you guys kind of know how to connect with people and stuff like that. So you kind of, you follow the podcast and you follow a couple of leopard gecko breeders. So what are some tips that you'd give um, for them and maybe seeing what people do in the ball python industry that you think a lot of people and leopard geckos could also do to be successful in the, kind of that realm of social media and marketing? I mean, I would think, so the, the Instagram accounts I follow for leopard geckos, I mean, they're really, really good. Uh, I would say that there's probably needs to be some branching out into the YouTube universe. And uh, I okay. know that's really worked for me personally, because uh, I have people that, only watch me on YouTube that don't even have Facebook and Instagram. So there's a whole, there's a whole genre of people out there that don't even mess around with the Instagrams and the Facebooks. And that, I know that seems really? weird to me, but yeah, that, when they contact me, it'll be by email because they'll tell me like they don't have any other way. They don't use social media. So, I mean, okay. there's a, there's a whole pocket of people out there that's being missed by not doing YouTube, you know? Yeah. Right. I guess I got to come over there and get a YouTube one one from <laughs> Shane Kelly figure out how you did all that because you pretty much started from you know the ground up like building everything and you see that progression um in your videos and it's really just about you know starting you got to start somewhere right and then kind of build your way up from there yeah i mean the first hurdle for me was just getting comfortable in front of the camera and, and honestly i still get get anxiety every time i look at it but i just i'm i'm obviously a lot more comfortable now but i just look at that camera and i get anxiety you know but <laughs> yeah and that even with the microphone like when i do the podcast and stuff and i'm just talking by myself to a microphone i'm like this is so stupid like what am i doing and i can imagine like having a camera and just shaking and <laughs> like you know filming myself or other people it just seems totally weird to me oh yeah talking to a camera lens is very unnatural at first but <laughs> but now i just see an audience on the other side i don't see a camera like once right. there's a little switch that clicks once i push record and then i just i'm okay. talking to i'm talking to people out there instead of talking to a camera now so. yeah but it's also weird because you're not getting any instant feedback like me and you if we have a conversation like i see even through the camera like i could see like you're responding to what i'm saying and all that stuff but when you're just talking to a microphone or a camera like you have no feedback to what you're saying which is super not natural to like human conversation no it's totally unnatural and and I always, uh, I always forget something. Like if I'm trying to explain like a project or something that I'm doing because I'm involved in it and I know all the ins and outs of it, I'll think, well, I can explain it. And I always forget something and then it never fails. There's somebody like DMing me like, well, you never mentioned, how, do, how are you doing this? Or what about this part? And I'm like, man, right. I always leave something out, but exactly. I try. <laughs> yeah. So when you do your videos, do you plan it out? Like, do you have, okay, I'm going to talk about, X, Y, Z, and then like make this transition or how do you like plan out your videos or even like starting from, you know, how you got started and like getting more comfortable and how you're doing your videos now? I'd say they're all different. Some of them, I do have a plan. Uh, 
if I'm highlighting a specific project or uh, I just did one that like on obscure jeans that'll be coming out pretty soon. So like those ones are planned. Other ones, like if it's a facility tour, I'm, I put the ball in their court and let them do whatever they're comfortable with. Uh, and then some that some I just shoot from the hip, man. Or like an egg cutting, that's just pretty much almost like a live video. I just edit out some of the gaps to, for time purposes and then just upload it. So it's okay. like everything is just 100% real. I give my wife the camera or, or I'll run the camera and she's cutting eggs, however it works. But that's like right. almost as close as, to being live as you can. Like I said, though, I do cut out gaps where there's no talking or whatever but uh yeah so i mean they're all a little bit different and everyone yeah. has their own niche too you know like i got friends that are really good at the science and explaining genetics and I, i've learned that that's not really my niche i'm not good at that so i just stay away <laughs> from that you know yeah exactly <laughs> yeah yeah it's talk about you know not talking about genetic odds or pos heads and all that's just yeah punnett squares right and right all right. that that's like this I understand all that stuff, but I'm just not good at presenting it. So I just yeah, explaining it is a totally different thing. Correct. Yeah, and, and I think that's like from from my point of view. I think there should be some leopard gecko content out there explaining that because I I'm kind of lost in the leopard gecko world, especially when it has to do with line breeding and stuff. So I yeah. personally would enjoy some leopard gecko channels out there. <laughs> I'll just tell you what to say, and then, like, once you get your geckos ready, you'll just do all that. So I'll just feed you the information, and you could be the guy <laughs> doing all that stuff. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, man. That's awesome, yeah. And I totally could see, again, like, the progression. And I think after you did that, um, once you headed over to Cusco's place, you could see a totally, like, just a change in how you thought about videos and how you did that so seeing that kind of once you meet with the right people and again that goes back to talking and making those connections you could see how that could just push you to a totally new level and how you do things yeah and you know big shout out to brian cusco man like i went over there because he's like the best reptile vlogger out there in my opinion you right know? And he's like a professional vlogger that has reptiles in his life you know very yeah. good and, and uh i asked him a bunch of questions and and he doesn't really give you the answer to your question. He points you in the direction to go research your answer. And then nice. you come up okay. with your own conclusion. You know what I mean? Yeah. I appreciate that. So yeah, Shout out definitely. To Cusco, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cusco is amazing. He's been on the podcast twice before. Um, so he's amazing. And the way he just does photography and stuff like that, I know like he'll just send me a video and like watch this and you'll just be in a rabbit hole <laughs> of all oh, that yeah. stuff. So I, I definitely know how that goes. And that, that was a big part of it too. Like, so then I went down a YouTube blogging rabbit hole and then I had to pull myself back. Like, what <laughs> am I? You know what I mean? Am I a vlogger? No, I'm a reptile guy that has a YouTube channel. So I had to kind of exactly. like find my own way in, the, in that, you know? Right. You'll be doing like cinematic shots and <laughs> have 50 oh. cameras in different angles. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a rabbit yeah. hole that just never ends, man. So, right. yeah kind of awesome. know your boundaries and or, i mean know my boundaries for now i mean i'm not saying i can't progress and grow in different directions and everything but I just kind of exactly. learn my place in it and, yeah. right yeah five years from now you'll probably be doing a totally different amazing thing um and again it's all about that progression and you just never know until the ball starts to get rolling and things start happening right so last time we talked we were talking about your breeding projects which even it's ball pythons and I get excited to, cause you guys have a gazillion genes. Um, so I always get excited about that. But last time we were talking about, um, your red stripe stuff that you got, um, redhead is a big gene that you have. Um, what else you have your clowns, the G stripe clown stuff. Um, yeah. so how is that stuff since the last time we talked and you hatched out tons of clutches. So how that's been going. Um, so my clown project, well, the red stripe that we were talking about back then, he never bred for me that first year. So that, that threw a wrench in my plans. Uh, I did use a backup male. I ended up hatching out four Batmans and one clutch, which is a pretty solid combination. That's a, a spot nose leopard clown. And, uh, that's, that's a, like a pretty landmark combo in the ball python world. And I, ha I have for all the leopard four. gecko people just look up all this stuff. It's, it's yeah. insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like my odds of hitting one was one in 16, and I hatched four. 
in that same clutch. So like I killed the odds on that. Yeah. One, you know? And they're I all just, dominant, right? So yeah. And all the, well, well the clown, the clowns are recessive. So I was a, right. to a visual on okay. that. So just hitting the leopard spot nose in a clown an actual visual clown was half the hurdle, but uh, I was just hoping for one and I happened to hit four. So I was really yeah. lucky, but I had some ups and downs. I lost a female from being egg bound. And another female give me 13 slugs, no good egg. Uh, so, and, I mean, it's, you, you take the, the lumps and, and run with the victories that you get, you know. But, uh, right. yeah, so now that red stripe clown, though, is breeding this year. So nice. <laughs> I, I learned a valuable lesson about having backup males my first season. Don't, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, no pun intended with that. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I had everything going on that red stripe clown. and. And he didn't do it, but everything turned out for the best. And I've invested in some other projects since then. I'm I'm continuing to push forward the genetic stripe clown project for sure. Building my double hats. Uh, like you said, I got into the red hat. I've been picking up some desert ghost and hypo melanistic stuff to add in nice. the collection, and uh, just kind of trying to diversify without spreading myself too thin, you know, stay focused on a few things and all right. Yeah. And something that I really like on your approach, um, and I kind of try to do this the best I can in leopard geckos, but also you have those staple genes like the desert ghost, the clown stuff, you know, all the amazing genes that are really cool to work with, but you also have some really cool things like the disco, which that's like totally over my head, but just watching your videos and you know, you have all these other dinker genes and stuff like that that you're working with um, to also try to develop those products a little bit because no one else is really working with them or knows how some of these genes even work with each other. Yeah, you know, it's it's fun to have something that, that has either been forgotten about or just left in the dust to sit there and do nothing or some little dinker genes. And uh, I think, in my opinion, though, the secret is kind of working that into also stuff that's popular, you know, because everyone knows like what Mojave's and clowns and pieds look like. Right. So if, you, if you bring something in a little different and see how it reacts and you know, if it goes good, it, it could build a good project up for you. But you know, if, if you're, this is just my opinion. If you have too many unheard of genes trying to work them all together, nobody knows what anything does. So I'm trying <laughs> to split the difference there. And right. I, Actually, that's something that uh, Justin Kabilka does. You know, he'll like he did it with the red stripe. You know, he brought it into the clown with black pastel and made Pompeys. And man, I mean, that like took the world by storm. So, right, exactly. So, for you, like, this is only your second breeding season, right? Yeah, yeah, this is okay. Yeah, we're just going into the second breeding season. Wow. So, going into your second season and laying out your foundation. So, you know, like in leopard geckos, there's the, you know, the genetic morphs, then also the line bread traits that we like to mix in. So for people who like from the ball python standpoint um, and how you kind of set up your projects, what has what have you found success in like setting up like your base genes and certain things that you want to combine together to kind of set yourself up in the future? Because I know you even talked about this in a video where instead of buying the animals, you save money producing them yourself. So how do you go about doing that and kind of setting yourself up for the future in terms of that? So with my personal plan, I'm I'm doing a, a couple double recessive projects. So like the genetic okay. stripe clown and, you know, which will be a double visual when once I get there. But uh, so right now I'm mixing clowns and genetic stripes to get the double heads, but mixing them where they have code or incomplete dominance with the snake too. So I'm making double heads that are loaded with incomplete dominance too. So when I actually do hit the visuals, my main goal later on, they'll be loaded with a whole bunch of other genetics too. So it won't wow. just be a genetic stripe clown. It'll be like a red stripe, black pastel genetic stripe clown or, or discos in there too. You know, it'll, it'll be a, a heavy hitter once you finally. Exactly. Hit. Yeah. That's just how I'm kind of looking at it. And then, and okay. then I also just have, I have some other snakes where there's no recessive, in there and i'm just kind of just playing around with genetics and uh i mean those those snakes are beautiful in their own right and they're kind of like entry level price range and that helps bring other people into the hobby and i'm having fun and and uh so yeah i'm kind of doing i'm doing upper end stuff and then some entry level stuff too all at the same time nice so for like the recessives and like going with recessives and then co-dominant and then dominant genes 
like how you found a balance i know it's only like your second season and you're still figuring things out um you're a beginner i'm a beginner at this stuff so have you found a way that's like a kind of a good mix where you're not trying to get like one out of 150 odds to get one snake which eventually of course it'll get there but like you know your first couple seasons actually producing cool stuff without missing on every single odd that you could get yeah well you know uh kind of goes to the parents you know the more genetics they have in them the less likely you are to hit like a normal but on the flip side is the less likely you are to hit the top animal too whatever your odds are to hit the the, the normal is the same if you get the top animal so i kind of just split right. the difference there and i mean like you said I'm i'm still pretty new so i'm kind of playing around that's why i have my my other little projects where it's just entry level i'm just kind of playing around with some genes that i haven't seen together and uh just seeing what comes out of it man and i'm having fun along the way too so right. i mean that's that's what it's all about i'm it's it's a passion and a learning experience and my mind's always working and, and for me it keeps me on my toes and trying to think outside the box so i'm not just trying to make something that everyone else has already been made you know for the past 20 years just try to combine different stuff together and see what happens you know exactly it's all a learning experience for everybody uh getting into this hobby and how we do things and i want to ask you a little bit about how that learning experience has been up for you when you're getting into all this stuff but then also how you making connection with other people has kind of shortened and flattened that learning curve um compared to like if you were just to be by yourself and independent to keeping all your projects together and not kind of talking with other people. Yeah. So, um, I consumed a lot. I still consume a ton of content trying to learn and stay on top and, uh, stay on top of everything that's going on. So like I had to start from the beginning. I started with a lot of audio podcasts, worked my way through all that. That's how I found your, your, uh, podcast, this one we're listening to right now. And, uh, a lot of YouTube and, that's how I learned a bunch. And then from that, I started branching out to people. And actually, I, I kind of looked around and seen which one of these guys I'm seeing on social media is in a, in a distance from me where I could like drive and meet them in person, you know? And, and then I just kind of branched out. And everywhere I go, I'm always like looking at how their facility runs, asking them how they do things. And that kind of flattened my curve. I've learned a lot of different approaches in a short amount of time and strategies business wise and genetic wise and i just kind of take it all in and hopefully i remember half of it <laughs> <laughs> exactly and then the other half goes on youtube and you have yeah. to go back and re-listen to see what you even said yeah 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 that's what i even do like with the podcast i'll have people on like the big guys on or whatever and then you see like wait he said something about that in the episode like i gotta go back and listen and see what people are talking about and always, you know, stay in the loop with, um, you know, keeping up with what people are saying and try to get that information to help you. Like always learning and consuming content. I think that's the best way to really keep on top of everything as well as, you know, creating content. You found uh, that balance. So going on with that, how have you found a balance and not just, you know, you being on your phone watching JKR all day, like learning about all this stuff, but also making a connection between, okay, consuming this content and talking to people but also sharing content and showing, you know, how you're breeding and certain things like that. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's hard to find a balance. Uh, I don't, I don't sleep too much and I'm always <laughs> busy, you know? And yeah. So like when I'm driving though, like I'll have YouTube playing like a podcast. Uh, once I run out of the audio podcast, I'll, I'll be playing YouTube like a podcast too. And, uh, I'm just, I just try to juggle things all at the same time, honestly. And then every night when we go to bed, me and my wife sit down and watch YouTube content <laughs> together too. So she has her particular channels that she likes. So I don't, I purposely don't watch them out on my own. And I still okay. go for, for our together, you know, little YouTube thing. And yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of hard uh, balancing and then creating my own content. And I try to like not copy anyone and just kind of, take everything I like from everyone and kind of create my own thing. And that's been a learning curve too. I mean, like I said, I've, uh, I've learned what I'm not good at. So I stay away from the, those kind of things. And then 
just kind of go other directions. Like I'm not the scientist guy, so I just stay away from <laughs> trying yeah. to, trying to act like it. That's just naturally not me. So exactly, yeah. So for um, like the ball python industry, for example, um, there's a ton of creators. There's a lot of people on YouTube, a lot of big uh Instagram pages and podcasts. Even like that on their own is like almost every breeder has a podcast now. So how have you kind of differentiated yourself and kind of made Small Town Exotics and Shane Kelly a different type of brand and type of account than kind of all the other bigger guys who are already in this and have been doing it for a while? I've just kind of just stayed to just kind of like what we just talked about. I just learned kind of what my strengths are. I stay away from my weaknesses and I just try to bring positivity everywhere. I don't try to copy anyone's format or anything. I have my own little way of doing things. And I just network with everyone and stay positive with everyone. And it just seems to be like a snowball effect. And I didn't know that going into this. That's just how I naturally am. And just going with nature just kind of brought me to here. Uh, it, it has been, since COVID hit, there has been a lot, an influx of uh interview style content out there and i can't keep up with all that i'll be <laughs> honest with you i yeah. used to be able to keep up to it when there was a few shows but now that there's like i can't keep up with everyone i mean there's, right. there's a lot out there yeah but i i try to i try to support and watch everyone's stuff and give them feedback along the way and i mean but in the end i'm only human i can only do so much so <laughs> exactly and it's even in just ball pythons alone there's oh my gosh so many people who have youtubes and now like podcasts are now big things since quarantine hit and i feel like once that hit it was kind of the deciding factor where are people just gonna continue doing what they're doing or even slack off or kind of bump it up because there's a few podcasts that i know ball python podcasts are kind of that interview style type thing where people just dropped off and aren't doing it anymore so you see yeah. kind of the difference between that and then people who kind of bumped it up a notch yeah that, i mean it's definitely been a, a quick evolution of stuff, you know? Uh, right. And, and going back to just me staying in my lane and, and my boundaries, like I knew from the beginning, like I never personally wanted to have like an interview style format, whether it was audio or YouTube format. I mean, that's just not my personality. I'm more than willing to go on anyone's or whatever, but uh, right. I, I like to listen to them. So I just kind of just stayed with what I knew, like, hey, man, I'm just kind of doing these vlog style videos. And uh, that's just what I'm going to stay with. And I'll just work on trying to get those better. And uh, and then doing my uh, my Instagram content and just kind of work on what I'm working on instead of trying to diversify too much and spreading myself thin. So I just kind of focused on what I like to personally do and the content I like to put out. Exactly. And for me, I found that it keeps me the most motivated. Like I again with like youtube i haven't one reason why i haven't gone on youtube is just a time thing like i don't have i barely get enough sleep as it is like i couldn't do another you know youtube thing and i kind of neglect that platform so it wouldn't be you know enough for me to go ahead and do it but you've kind of focused in on what you're good at and what you like and focused in on that and that's you've been getting great results with that so that's been really awesome to see from your end yeah and i mean i'm a big fan of the audio style podcast you know i am a big fan of that like i love right. that stuff when i'm driving around and i do a lot of driving for my normal life you know and so like yeah. I love that stuff. to me there's not enough of that out there and there's a <laughs> there's a gazillion of youtube you know so that's why i was saying like i kind of listen to it like I'll, I'll get those interview style ones up on, on my phone while i'm driving around and listen to them like they're an audio style because it's not like they're really showing snakes or whatever but right yeah i kind of supplement those in for the audio but yeah. And I feel like you've been going everywhere recently. Like, yeah, I know you go up to Freedom Breeder uh, pretty often. And then also, like, you were down in Georgia recently and Tennessee a few times. And you've just been traveling a lot and, you know, meeting a lot of new people and talking to new people. So how's that been going to new facilities and um, kind of traveling a little bit during this quarantine time? Well, it's been wonderful. And actually... This may sound a little selfish, but traveling during quarantine is very quick and easy, man. I mean, the, <laughs> the line for TSA and stuff is like you just in and out. Yeah, yeah, man. So I mean, that's one good thing about about everything. But uh, 
Yeah, you know, that's that kind of goes to me, it just goes to the reptile community. Like our community as a whole is so diverse and so spread out that like when I wanted to go look around in Tennessee to possibly move there, like I just reached out to breeders over there and like they welcomed me with open arms and like going to Georgia and staying with Tony from Hardwired Exotics. Like I stayed at his house. Me and my wife stayed with him and his family and then went to Justin's. I mean, it's, I've never experienced anything like that in any other community or industry or anything I've been involved in. So, Right. And that's awesome. And I don't think it's anything like the reptile industry. And like we were talking before with U.S. Stark, like when we need a band together and all come together as a community, that's what we do. Um, so it's really awesome to see that even though, again, we're not at shows in, in person, we're still able to do that and connect through Facebook and Instagram and create that tight community. Um, and we're always there when we need each other for anything like that. Yeah, and we got we got a, a whole bunch of reptile breeders in Canada supporting U.S. Arc as part of this whole push and drive right, right now and stuff. And I mean, that's phenomenal, man. I mean, they're in another country and they're still supporting what's going exactly. on. Exactly. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah, you did you, you expect that at all when you were getting started with this, like how the community is? No, I had no idea, honestly. I mean, I like I said, I kind of started off with the local people I could actually physically meet, but I had no idea that it would like branch out that far. Yeah, I had no idea. I, I, I would have never imagined this in a million more in a million years, right? It again, it's crazy, and I don't think I asked you about this on the other podcast, but. Um, going back to reptile shows at the Anaheim show, uh, was that your first U.S. auction, your U.S. Arc auction? Yeah. So yeah. how was like that and talking to people and like just being again in that community environment, being able to meet all those cool people there? That was kind of like a like a coming of age in the reptile industry for me. <laughs> that was my first auction, and it was yeah. like so many people at that auction that I had been. Uh, connecting with over social media and like I got to meet a whole bunch of people at the same time face to face and I was like right. man I finally get to see like oh so and so is actually short and so and so is actually really <laughs> tall and like I had no idea you know and it, it was just really cool man and that was like that to me that was even better than the show because like I just sat around and, and talked to people face to face and bounced ideas off them and you know just kind of like a fellowship of, of reptile geeks you know and that was exactly. the best part. And, and I didn't even, I bid on a couple things and I won a couple of silent auction items, but like just. Unless you're like dropping, it's crazy to win something at one of those auctions. It's when you get Miguel there and he buys up everything. <laughs> so it's crazy. Yeah, man. I wanted that Yoda lamp and uh, man, that, that thing ended up like going up over a thousand dollars or something. I was like, yeah, I'm a back off yeah. on that, you know. <laughs> Mrs. Small Town might not be too happy. <laughs> yeah. You spend yeah. how much on a lamp? <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that's a but big awesome. reason why yeah. everyone's doing a, a push for us arc right now because they're not getting that auction money that they used to get so right because exactly shows aren't going on so when you don't have you know tinley happening or the super shows or the daytona or any of those big shows um you know that's how they make a lot of their money is those auctions but you see even the facebook group with like people helping us arc auctions and um even people who need help for other COVID relief and stuff like that. We all come together as a community um, to help each other. And that's really what it really is all about. It's the passion for the animals. And then the people are just such a big part of that, which is really cool to see. Yeah, there's actually another one going on right now too for uh, the, the Texas relief, since a lot of them got like, you know, they went through an ice age and Texas yeah. isn't set up for that. And they all lost right. a lot of animals and that, a whole bunch of stuff happened to them. So. Exactly. Everyone, everyone banded together to to start doing stuff for them too. So it's it's really yeah. it's really cool. I've seen it since I got in here. It was like they're doing it for Chase in his surgery. A friend of mine lost his daughter. And people banded together to help pay for that. I mean, just like one thing after another. Like I see people fight and like bicker. There's a little <laughs> bit of drama, but if something bad happens, like everyone stops what they're doing and goes and helps out. And yeah, then, it's then crazy. Once all that's done, then they might bicker a little bit more. But... <laughs> <laughs> exactly you see all the facebook groups and it's like next day it's back to normal people bickering and but again like at the end of the day we all come together um because we're you know we're passionate and at the end of the day we're kind of the reptile geeks that you know people don't expect to have a hundred ball pythons in their you know little room or whatever um so we all band together uh to go and support each other when 
whoever needs help, really. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So last question I really wanted to ask you uh, for having you on. I know that you're really interested in the leopard gecko stuff. And, you know, your sons have a pair, which is really cool that you're breeding. So I I know they're really interested in that's kind of their pet project. So what are their interests in leopard geckos? And then also what brings you to kind of be interested in leopard geckos and listening to my podcast, being a ball python guy? Well, so I, I'm a, I love the genetics and anything. So I'm a, I'm a nerd over that stuff. And uh, when I had reptiles before, and I had a whole bunch of different species, like I did have a leopard gecko back then, like when, you know, it was just normals everywhere. Oh, okay. For the most yeah. part, normals, but uh, there wasn't a whole bunch going on with them yet. But uh, that was one of my favorite pets that I had was a leopard gecko. So they got a, they got a special place in my heart. And then okay. uh, what, what excites me about leopard geckos is, man, like, you can move projects fast with them because they like reproduce and are back up to breeding. So they're like up to breeding size. Like you could like really see a progression right. fast in that. So yeah. That's what interests yeah, me. And, and then pretty I'll, much I'll, a year, I'll, like you'll get a female ready and a male ready to go. And I'd like ball pythons. It takes forever to get a male and female up to breeding size. So you kind of get those quick results, which is super cool. Unlike, you know, with snakes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you could get a male ball python up to size, like you know, they can they can be breeding within a year, but a female man, it's pretty much like a three year thing. I mean, some will breed in two, some might not breed till five years. So I mean, wow, yeah, it's it's kind of random, you know. <laughs> yeah, with these leopard geckos, you'll start seeing like projects going super quick. What you could do in, uh, you know, a couple years with leopard geckos, it might take you like twenty years with ball pythons to get certain genes together matching up um and then we talked about the line bread aspect too which is you don't really see that much i know they have like different lines of pastel um which is really cool but like some of the other genes it's kind of pretty much what you see is what you get yeah i mean in ball pythons that would your best example of line breeding would probably be pastel i mean there's like the lemon and the blonde and that would probably be as close as you got to line breeding but right. leopard geckos have the line breeding and, and the recessives and all that cool stuff eye morphs i mean like i was like <laughs> they have morphs for the eyes it's crazy yeah. man so i mean we it's... don't have a blue eye lucy though we don't have any lucists so that's like we need to get there that'll be you know the pinnacle yeah we don't have one yet i mean that's <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> but exactly. uh, yeah man the leopard yeah. geckos are really cool uh i've kind of talked to you i, I want to like make a black and purple one at some point once i okay once i get moved at some point you know but uh, right yeah yeah. After I this like first it. year, start testing and, you know, seeing what you produce and uh, get your feet wet and, you know, start slow. And then once you start building up, seeing, you know, you talked about the uh, black and purple Leo, um, seeing what your son's like, getting in them into genetics and stuff like that. That'll be a really cool another family project, along with like the hog nose and ball pythons and stuff like that to kind of grow together, which will be cool. Yeah, and I, I'm keeping my eye on what's uh, going on with that cypher project you guys got going too. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see where that goes. And, you know, okay. I, asking I, from I, your I, standpoint, I watch a little bit of everything. <laughs> yeah. So from your standpoint, like we talked about that, what are some other genes that you think, like, I want to hear from your perspective, like what are some genes, where are you thinking in terms of projects, um, genes that you like and you think will look really cool together? For leopard geckos? Yeah, for leopard geckos. Uh, man, well, I really like the snows. I like the Albi snows that you showed. They seem they seem to pop. They stand okay. out to me. Uh, so a non leopard gecko, like you know, I, I like leopard leopard geckos and stuff, but I'm not in it day in day out. Right. Um, the Albi snows pop to me. Uh. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I mean, I don't want to catch any hate, but man, I, I see enough orange in the ball python world, so I'm I kind of shy away from the tangerine stuff. I mean, I, I like yeah. the dark stuff and and light stuff, purple stuff, stuff like that catches my eye. So okay, I kind of see that in with the snows and uh, and then the eyes, man. I, I like those eclipse eyes. I mean, there's just something cool about it, man. When you look at him, I'm like, man, that looks like an alien or something. That's like, that's like not natural, you know? It's yeah. like, that's crazy. You know? Exactly. Get that snow with some, you know, bold and maybe some eclipse in there. That's what it, you know, sounds like where you're trying to go. 
Yeah, yeah, the bowl. Yeah, that's that was one I was forgetting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get you set up, man. Next thing you know, like we get you. We don't have as many genes, like I said, but get you a little bit of line breeding in there, and <laughs> you'll be set up for the rest of your, you know, little project that you got going on over there. Yeah, and that's what's cool about leopard geckos too. So like when you think of line breeding from a ball python standpoint, you're like, man, I'm gonna have to hand this off to the next generation of, of my kids. You know what I mean? But like right. leopard geckos, since they like skip ahead so fast with their generations, man, you can like see progress in that. Yeah. You know? Exactly. It'll be like a couple years and you'll, you know, if, if you have something that's really spotted um, and you're trying to go for that bold look, it takes really a couple generations to get that going on. And you could get that bold look really quickly without even having to invest that much money from the beginning, which is, you know, really cool from that standpoint. Oh, you know what else catches my eye in the leopard geckos? The white and yellows. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Those, those, yeah. But yeah. White and yellows are cool. What? I think those would kind of be like, so, okay. I want to ask you this. So in your opinion, like, what do you think is like the difference between, well, there's definitely a difference between like pastel and yellow belly, but like, that's what I kind of think of as white and yellow. But like, what do you think the white and yellow would kind of lean towards more? Like if you're kind of translated to ball pythons, white and yellow, um, what do you think? Yellow belly or pastel? Um, I would say yellow belly. Cause it's like an enhancer, you know? It, okay. Uh, that's that's that would be my take on it but okay interesting yeah well shane it was awesome to catch up and finally you know get to talk to you after a while and talk ball pythons and geckos and you know just reptile guys it's awesome to hear people from different industries and get their standpoint on things and um you know also just catch up and hang out on the podcast yeah man it was good talking to you again and feels like it's been forever i mean it's been a year but <laughs> exactly yeah Got to hook up again, like when shows start happening and, you know, finally talk to each other and dang, like once this COVID stuff has pretty much been killing a lot of the shows. So once shows start happening, definitely we'll have to meet up again. Yeah, I'll have to go and check out your booth again and get some pointers from you on how to set up for shows and stuff. Because I've never been to the show still because all this happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Well, you got to get the keep getting the interview so i don't know once you're vending like that's a whole nother <laughs> issue with yeah. getting interviews and vending that's a whole different thing <laughs> yeah 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 I, I, but I, I i need to do it at least once i think but yeah. right definitely yeah so we talked about this on uh part one but for anybody who skipped that for any reason uh all your social media and stuff like that how could people follow you and then also get in contact if you know maybe a gecko person wants to get a ball python um small town exotics the exotic is spelled x-o-t-i-c-s there's no e in it um i'm real responsive on instagram i'll I, on youtube as well i do have a facebook page for the business but um i just don't really like the app too much you know the mechanics <laughs> of the app don't really notify me that good and uh a uh, personal facebook page shane kelly k-e-l-l-e-y i pretty much accept everyone as long as you're nice and yeah man email small town exotics at gmail i mean any of those ways but instagram i'm that's where i'm most responsive if you need to get all awesome well shane i appreciate you a lot for coming on the podcast again and we'll have to talk soon yeah good one evan all right thank you and that concludes this episode of the podcast i appreciate shane for coming on the podcast not only once but twice to do this two-part series on networking within the reptile hobby super awesome for him to come on and share his wisdom and spread his knowledge for the rest of us listening to the podcast. I want to thank everyone for joining us on yet another episode of the Strength in Leo's podcast. Don't forget to share with a friend, rate our podcast, and subscribe. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Strength in Leo's. And last but not least, tune in next time for our next episode on Spotify, iTunes, Google Music, and our website strengthinleos.com. This is your host Evan Wildred signing off. Continue to grow in knowledge and share the strength and Leo's. Thank you.